Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining the Lake Superior Quinn and Midwest Kidney Network Depression and Chronic Illness Focus on CKD and ESRD. Your host for today is Mark Lausch. Mark, you may begin. Thanks so much, Chris. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Lake Superior Quality Innovation Network and Midwest Kidney Network Collaborative Learning in Action Network presentation today by Dr. Balwinder Bell, Singh. Uh, titled uh, Depression and Chronic Illness, a focus on chronic kidney disease and end-stage renal disease. We're very happy to have Dr. Singh here today uh, to talk about this topic. Uh, before I introduce Dr. Singh, I want to remind everybody that one continuing medical education credit is available to all participants who view the presentation in its entirety and have registered with a valid email through WebEx. Um, and then complete the online evaluation that will be sent to your email address five to seven days from today. Social workers will also need to complete a 10-question post-test that will be included in the email. So you'll get an email with a link to go and do the evaluation, and if you're a social worker, the post-test, and you, you'll be able to print out your CE certificate at that time from that link. Um, so a couple of disclaimers here. No commercial support has been received for this learning activity. The speaker and planners of the event reported no conflicts of interest. For CE credits or a certificate of attendance, you must attend the entire session and complete the online evaluation that I referenced a minute ago. And again, social workers uh, need to complete the post-test. And we also encourage everyone to complete the evaluation to provide feedback on the session. Um, I'll mention this again at the end of the webinar, so uh, if you didn't get it, that's, uh, you'll, you'll hear it at the end. So let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Singh. Dr. Singh completed his medical training at Goa Medical College in Goa, India. He subsequently completed his master's degree in clinical and translational, translational science, excuse me, at Mayo Graduate School, Mayo Clinic College of Medicine, Rochester, Minnesota. He completed his residency in psychiatry at the University of North Dakota School of Medicine and Health Services in Fargo, North Dakota, where he also served as a chief resident. He is a mood psychiatrist, senior associate consultant, and assistant professor of psychiatry at the Mayo Clinic in the Mayo College, excuse me, Mayo Clinic College of Medicine and Science, again, in Rochester, Minnesota. Dr. Singh has research time support from uh, MedBio. Me uh, Mayo Clinic has a financial interest in Assurance Health. It is unrelated to this talk, and Dr. Singh has not received any research support from Assurance. Thanks, uh, you know, thanks to uh, Dr. Singh for presenting us today. Without any further ado, um, I want to introduce our esteemed presenter, Dr. Bellwinder Singh. Take it away, Dr. Singh. Thank you, Mark. Uh, I appreciate this opportunity. Uh, so uh, let's start the, uh, the topic. Uh, so the topic for today's talk is depression and chronic illness, uh, focus on chronic kidney disease and uh, end-stage renal disease. Um, Let's move to the next one. Okay. So the objective of the talk is to um, identify an association between depression and chronic medical illness, uh, and then to focus on uh, the impact of depression in patients with chronic kidney disease and end-stage renal disease, and uh, lastly, uh, but not the least, to kind of evaluate frequent interventions in patients with depression and chronic kidney disease and end-stage renal disease. Okay, so uh, let's start with the case. Uh, we have a 55-year-old uh, single male. Um, he's a sailor by profession, history of chronic kidney disease, GFR of 33, uh, history of chronic, uh, sorry, coronary artery disease, fatigue, and nausea. And you see the patient in your clinic and their PHK-9 score is 11. Um, question number one and two or, and nine on PHK-9. I hope you are all are familiar with the PHK-9 uh, uh, questionnaire, uh, it's very commonly used in um, most of the uh, outpatient clinic. So if you look at the score of PHK-9 of uh, 11, but looking at the question number 1, 2, 9, and 0, can this patient have major depression? Okay. Uh, so, uh, and I'll discuss about this uh, later on uh, uh, with other slides. Okay. All right, so let's look at the second case. We have a uh, same same history, but the score has gone down. So the overall score has gone down from 11 to 9. But if you look at question number 1 and 2, the score is 2 there. Uh, and question number 9, which uh, basically look at uh, 
this patient has suicidal ideation or any thoughts of better off dead in the last two weeks. And question number one and two, which is uh, focused on if the patient's feeling sad or depressed or if there is uh, symptoms of anhedonia. So in this uh, in the case number two, patient answered yes to uh, question number one and two. So the question here is which patient has more likelihood of having a major depression? Okay. And so with this, we, uh, let's look at what is major depressive disorder. Okay. So for major depressive disorder, what we look for at least five or more symptoms of uh, 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 five more of these symptoms during the same two-week period. And of those five symptoms, one of the symptoms has to be either depressed mood or loss of interest or pleasure, uh, we call it anhedonia. Now, the important thing is that we, we do not include symptoms that are clearly attributable to another medical condition because symptoms like uh, tiredness, fatigue, insomnia, hypersomnia, these are very common in patients with chronic medical illnesses. Uh, in chronic kidney disease and especially with end stage renal disease. So one of the two symptoms has to be depressed mood or loss of interest. If we don't have those two uh, symptoms, then the patient will not meet the criteria for major depressive disorder. And if they have one of those uh, symptoms, then we look for four more symptoms, other changes in sleep pain or, or psychomotor renovation, uh, agitation, change in appetite or change in weight, uh, fatigue, loss of energy, uh, worthlessness, uh, difficulty with attention concentration, and recurrent parts of deficit. So I think this is very important because a lot of places uh, uh, where a lot of consultation or psychiatric consultation triggered by a PHQ-9 score or some form of uh, a screening score, uh, we have to uh, pay attention to where are the patients scoring, uh, getting those scores. Okay. So prevalence of major depression, uh, in general population, the prevalence of major depression is about 8.1%. Uh, 8 Lifetime prevalence of uh, depression, uh, major depression is about 17% in the U.S. Uh, now, we're looking at other chronic medical conditions such as heart disease, diabetes, HIV, chronic kidney, you can see the prevalence goes higher in uh, pretty much all the chronic, uh, chronic medical illnesses. Okay. And what are the possible causes for increased prevalence of major depression in chronic uh, illnesses? One of the major reasons is psychological reaction itself to the disease uh, development. You know, a patient who is healthy all their life and then suddenly they know they have, um, let's say, diabetes or chronic kidney disease, which is uh, progressive, which can be progressive. And so that itself can be uh, uh, difficult for some of the patients and that could be a risk factor for uh, 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 major depression. Uh, complication or uh, symptoms of disease, that's another factor. Side effects from medication treatment. So a lot of the medications like for patients who have seizures or uh, uh, um, we use anti-epileptics, a lot of the medication they themselves can have a, a side effect of depression. Um, indirect uh, or direct pathophysiological effects, for example, patients with stroke or multiple sclerosis, so they, the path, uh, biologically they put them at high risk of having depression. Indirect physiological effects, uh, chronic and medical illnesses, patients have uh, high cytokine levels or other inflammatory factors which, which also are, are, have, uh, have shown in the studies to increase risk of depression. Okay. Uh, depression and chronic medical illness. Uh, depression by itself amplifies a physical symptom associated with the medical illness. Uh, a recent meta-analysis has show, even showed that the depression itself is a predictor of development of chronic, uh, um, sorry, coronary artery disease that it can increase risk of diabetes almost two-fold time. So those physical symptoms they, uh, which are associated with depression, uh, with medical illness, they can amplify the symptoms. Increased comorbid condition to comorbidity, increased impairment in functioning. Uh, it decreases adherence to prescribed regimen. We know patients who have chronic illness, medical illness, and they have depression. Uh, the patient don't adhere to their uh, medication regimen. They have adverse health behaviors. Uh, they don't maintain their dietary regulation. They don't exercise as much. They smoke uh, more as compared to patients who don't have uh, uh, depression, there's increased risk of mortality with patients who have depression and chronic medical illnesses. Okay. 
Now, what's the relationship of depression to physical symptom perception? The thing in the study is that uh, depression interferes with adaptation to chronic uh, uh, aversive disease symptoms. Uh, the been studied um, done at uh, WashU where they showed that uh, when patients uh, with chronic medical illness, they are able to adapt to their chronic aversive disease symptoms. However, when they have comorbid depression and anxiety, in, with, along with chronic medical illness, that interfere with the adaptation process and the patient have a heightened awareness to their symptoms and have a poor quality of life. Uh, for example, in one of the studies, they look at a uh, patient who had diabetes. Depressive symptoms significantly correlate with, correlated with 9 to 11 symptoms, which are typically associated with poor glucose control. Uh, similarly, in patients with hepatitis C, higher depressive symptoms severely correlated with uh, impairment from the symptoms of fatigue. Uh, uh, same with coronary artery disease, more symptomatic reports of chest pain and fatigue, regardless of uh, the severity of their uh, uh, the uh, uh, heart disease. Uh, depression and functional impairment. Uh, we know with, with depression, uh, the people who have depression, uh, regardless of their chronic medical condition, they uh, have more uh, functional disability, they lose more work days, uh, uh, they're decreasing quality and distant life years. And it independently predict increased rate of functional decline in patients, especially patients who are 65 years and above, regardless of their uh, disease severity. So depression by itself is predictive of functional impairment over time despite the severity of their physical illness. Uh, medical utilization, we know depression, uh, it in, along with the medical, uh, chronic medical illness, uh, it does increase risk of uh, medical costs. Uh, the total ambulatory cost uh, in one of the studies was about 43 to 52 percent higher, and for inpatient cost was about 47, so about 50 percent higher in depressed patients compared to non-depressed patients after adjusting for their chronic medical illness. They had longer, they had longer length of stay, increased cardiac rehospitalization rate, uh, and more primary care uh, appointment and medication uh, in patients with depression as compared to who don't have depression. Okay. Uh, increased cardiac risk, uh, we know depression increased risk of death from cardiovascular disease, especially in men. Uh, there are some possible uh, mechanisms and hypotheses which have been uh, studied. Uh, one of the uh, 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 hypotheses is uh, that depression decreases heart rate variability, especially in cardiac uh, patients, uh, patients with heart disease, and that is a risk factor for cardiac mortality. Uh, increased platelet aggregation has been seen in patients with depression, uh, higher level of inflammatory markers, especially CRP, interleukin-6, uh, which despite the patient having cardiovascular disease, uh, so that is independent of uh, uh, after adjusting for the cardiovascular disease. Uh, another possible mechanism is uh, decreased adherence to lifestyle changes such as exercising, quitting smoking, and taking their medication. Okay. Uh, now we'll uh, look for what's the impact of depression in patients with chronic kidney disease and end-stage renal disease. So what is chronic kidney disease? It's a slight decrease in kidney function to uh, severe decrement leading to uremia. Uremia, uh, patients have lack of appetite, nausea, vomiting, fatigue, lack of interest, somnolence, delirium, seizures can happen in, uh, delirium and seizures can happen in late stages. Uh, end-stage renal disease or end-stage kidney disease have worse medical outcomes, autonomic dysregulation, uh, behavior, uh, non-adherence. Okay. Uh, so this is uh, basically uh, we are looking at how we define chronic kidney disease classification based on GFR along with uh, albuminuria. Uh, so if your GFR is below uh, 60 uh, and uh, as it goes down, that's how they uh, define the stages of uh, chronic kidney disease. Okay, now depression scales cut off. Um, so if you look at a lot of the uh, common screening tools, uh, PHQ-9 or PHQ-2, especially PHQ-9, if five, um, score of five and above, in general population is class five to nine is classified as mild depression. But clinically relevant, when we look for clinically relevant depression symptoms, we, in most of the study, we look for at least a score of 10 and above. 
Uh, same for back depression inventory, uh, it has been shown uh, that we look for at least a score of 14 to 16. Uh, Center for Epidemiological Studies Depression Scale, the cutoff has been, uh, which has been used especially in patients with chronic kidney disease, is 18. So what we what we are seeing is patients who have a chronic medical illness or chronic kidney disease, for that matter, the cutoff score is higher than in general population because those patients have higher fatigue. Uh, higher uh, 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 sleep problems regardless of depression symptoms. And that's one of the reasons why in most of the studies they look for a higher cutoff score in a lot of the de depression skills. Okay. Now what's the prevalence of depression in chronic kidney disease and end stage renal disease? So uh, the prevalence of depression is three to four times higher than in, general pop in the general population. It's, it's even two to three times higher than other chronic medical illnesses. Now, the important thing to remember here is patients who screen positive for depression may not necessarily have depression. Uh, again, it, it, it varies if you're, if your screening tool is a PHP-9 and your patient scores 10 and above, they may screen positive, but they may not have depression. So it has to be uh, confirmed clinically uh, with a clinical interview uh, uh, for a patient to be diagnosed with major depression. Uh, in the study, they, were look, they looked at the uh, patient who had uh, and they were receiving dialysis. The prevalence of depression by screening question here was 39% and 23% that many people do it. It's still fairly high. Uh, uh, Cognitive disease, prevalence with the screening question here was 27, but it went on to 20%. So 21 to 22, and that's almost to the, uh, all three of the two general population. Uh, minorities, they have a higher uh, rate of depression, uh, uh, especially in black and Hispanic populations. They are less likely to use antidepressants, uh, although some studies have shown mixed results, but overall, when you look at the data, the, uh, minorities have a higher risk of uh, depression uh, in patients with chronic kidney disease and end-stage renal disease. Uh, depression and, out, uh, and outcomes in chronic kidney disease. Uh, what we've seen in the study is uh, patients who have depression have a high risk of hospitalization, high risk of acute kidney injury, faster rate of decline in their EGFR, increased risk of mortality. They have adverse psychosocial outcomes, um, including poor quality of life, poor social support, and sexual dysfunction. And these are regardless of the severity of their, uh, uh, of their chronic kidney disease and other comorbid conditions. Now looking at depression and uh, outcomes in end stage renal disease, uh, patients have more fatigue, poor sleep quality, pain, higher uh, sexual dysfunction, poor psychosocial outcomes, and again lower quality of life. Uh, patients uh, who have depression, they have increased emergency department visits, higher uh, risk of hospitalization, and accumulated hospital days. So overall, more utilization of resources, poor outcome higher cardiovascular events uh, and withdrawal from dialysis, and even higher risk of suicide in this population. Uh, they have a 1.5 times increased mortality in patients on dialysis independent of confounding factors. So that's, that's a big, uh, about 50% jump. That's a big risk factor. Okay. Now, what are the risk factors uh, for depression in patients with end-stage renal disease and chronic kidney disease? So in end-stage renal disease, younger age, so younger age of diagnosis of end-stage renal disease, female population, white race, longer duration of dialysis, comorbid diabetes and coronary artery disease, cerebral vascular disease and peripheral vascular disease have shown to be uh, the uh, risk factors for depression. With chronic kidney disease, similar risk factor, uh, other than the race, the, the black race and Hispanic ethnicity has shown to be a, 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 a high risk factor for depression, lower education, lower family income, smoking status. So those are additional uh, confirm, uh, factors for depression in uh, chronic kidney disease patients. Okay. Uh, depression and coping in adults undergoing dialysis. So this was a study. Um, uh, connected in Malaysia. It was a cross-sectional study looking at uh, uh, several dialysis centers. Uh, and the study uh, author used a, uh, a back depression inventory and brief cope scale. Uh, it's a brief cope scale with a 28-item uh, 
uh, lighter scale, uh, basically the higher scale represent greater coping strategies uh, from the patient. So they had about uh, 274 end-stage renal disease patients, uh, 183 patients were undergoing hemodialysis, uh, 91 patients uh, were undergoing continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis. But they found in the study that behavior disengagement and self-blame were the predictors for depression. So if we try to explain this, uh, Basically, patients who use self-blame or have more social isolation and use those as a coping strategies, they had a, a higher risk of depression uh, as compared to others. Uh, for example, patients often blame themselves for causing inconvenience and burden to others for their um, dependence, on, dependence on transportation to the dialysis centers. Uh, their sense of helplessness and guilt that can uh, that has shown to be a uh, 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 result, resulting in depression in, in that study. Okay? So the support from family members and counseling uh, may help reduce the level of depression and self-blame and may enhance uh, the, uh, their quality of life. Better outcomes would they found in the study if they had good interpersonal and treatment control and greater understanding of their illness, those were found to be uh, 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 a better predictor of a treatment outcome. What are the mechanisms of depression and adverse medical outcomes? So behavioral changes, what we know, uh, uh, patients who have depression, they have lack of social support, uh, no adherence to self-care, adverse health behaviors, uh, biologically higher comorbid condition, inflammation. Inflammation is a, uh, has shown to be, there's a bi uh, has shown a bi-directional relationship with depression. Uh, inflammatory disorder increased risk of depression, and vice versa, depression increased risk of inflammation as well. Hormonal abnormalities, so those are some of the biological mechanisms for depression and adverse medical outcomes. Okay. Now, looking at what are the treatment interventions or how do, uh, how do we approach with patients with uh, chronic kidney disease uh, and end-stage renal disease and depression? Okay. So create this flow diagram to simplify uh, uh, way to kind of look at uh, how do we assess. So let's say if we use uh, PHQ-9, and I apologize for using PHQ-9, but it seems like that's one of the most common tools, so I went ahead with PHQ-9. So if you use PHQ-9 in your clinic, uh, it's really available. Based on if, if your score, uh, the score, uh, the patient score uh, a 10 and higher on the PHQ-9, and if the question number one and two, or either one or two is positive, then you assess the patient for uh, major depression. If their score, uh, if they score negative on question number one and two, and their score is higher than ten, then you look for other uh, other medical causes which can explain or which could contribute to fatigue, attention, concentration. Now, if you see uh, question number nine, which is uh, looking at suicidal ideation, if that is positive, that, regardless of what's the cause, uh, that needs to be uh, evaluated in detail. So if a patient uh, score higher, greater than 10, uh, score greater than or equal to 10, and the question number one and two, or one, one or two is positive, we do, uh, com it will be uh, better to have a complete assessment for major depression and if a patient has uh, meet the criteria for clinical depression, then there are uh, uh, different approaches, whether uh, pharmacological intervention or we approach this in a non-pharmacological intervention way. Okay? So we'll talk about pharmacological intervention and then we'll talk about non-pharmacological intervention. In non-pharmacological intervention, uh, we look at psychotherapeutic uh, uh, measures, we look at exercise, uh, we look at alternative therapies like music, yoga, meditation, and then we'll talk uh, individually about this. Okay. All right. Uh, treatment of depression. So combination of depression, antidepressant and psychotherapy has been shown to be more effective in chronic illnesses. Uh, collaborative care models have shown consistent improvement in medical outcomes. Uh, there are limited studies in this, uh, specifically in this patient population. Uh, what we have seen in the studies is that patients with depression and chronic kidney disease, depression is undertreated. 
Only 31 to 35 percent, so about only one third of patients receive uh, antidepressant medication in this, in this uh, patient population. Um, antidepressants. So in end-stage renal disease, the data is sparse and is inconclusive. Uh, there are uh, very few studies looking at uh, antidepressants in this patient population. Uh, we have monitored closely for side effects and drug interaction in this population uh, because of um, uh, patients are on um, medications for chronic kidney disease or for end-stage renal disease, they are undergoing hemodialysis. Uh, we know that phosphate binders or antacids, they can decrease the oral bioavailability of antidepressants. So we have to be very careful and cautious uh, and monitor for uh, uh, side effects when patients are on antidepressant in this uh, population. Uh, fluoxetine, cytopram, peroxetine, sertraline. So these are four SSRIs which have been studied. Um, there, there was a small study looking at mesazodone as well. Um, so for these four SSRIs, uh, we normally do not require dose reduction in this patient population. If you look at SNRI or uh, serotonin and norepinephrine uh, reuptake inhibitors, venlafaxine or duloxetine, uh, or if you're looking at atypical antidepressants such as mirtazapine or bupropion, dose reduction is recommended. So, for example, venlafaxine, uh, we, uh, rec uh, in the study, we recommended doses about 50% uh, of uh, the normal dose. So, for a normal young adult, if you use, uh, if you target about 150 to 225 milligrams venlafaxine at a daily dosage, in a patient with end-stage renal disease, your target dose would be uh, about 75 to 112.5, so it will be about 50 percent dose reduction based on toleration and uh, looking at other factors, okay? So the recent meta-analysis um, which showed SSI does improve uh, depressive symptoms, so uh, although the data is sparse, still SSRIs are considered uh, the first-line treatment of uh, partial antidepressant treatment in this group. Uh, ongoing RCT, so there are um, three or four ongoing RCTs. The first RCT uh, on the top, uh, looking at about 180 patients with major depression and stage 3 to 5 chronic kidney disease who are not on hemodialysis. Uh, in this study, um, they looked at uh, com uh, comparing sertraline versus placebo, so that study is uh, already complete, uh, and I'll, I'll show the results of that study. Uh, it was a 12-week study, uh, and they used quits. That's one of the uh, uh, tools to measure depression symptoms. There's another study which is ongoing right now comparing fluoxetine with bupropion in patients with hemodialysis and major depression. Uh, another study is uh, looking at comparison of acetalopram versus placebo, um, and there's another study uh, which is looking at patients with dysthymia as well. Uh, so this is the CAS trial. So in this trial, they look for effective sertraline on depressive symptoms in patients with chronic kidney disease uh, without dialysis uh, dependent. So they had about 201 patients with stage 3, uh, 4 or 5 known dialysis dependent chronic kidney disease. Uh, the study was conducted at three U.S. medical centers. Uh, in this study, uh, a patient was randomized to sertraline. Uh, about 100, uh, 102 uh, patients were uh, subject to randomized to sertraline for 12 weeks at an initial dose of 50 milligrams per day, which is kind of a standard dose to initiate sertraline. And they were uh, the dose uh, uh, can be uh, could be escalated to up to 200 milligrams, which is normally the uh, highest FDA recommended dose based on tolerability and response. As com and they were compared to patients who received a matching placebo, and the sample size was pretty equivalent, and of 99. Okay. Primary outcome: they were looking at uh, improvement in depressive symptom severity from baseline to 12 weeks. And they use this 16-item, uh, um, what we call it, CRIDS, or Quick Inventory of Depressive Symptomology Clinician Rating. Um, uh, 
part, subjects were uh, at least had one assessment after randomization, and they were all included in the primary analysis. Okay. Uh, higher scores, again, indicates more severe depression. Score to uh, patients or subjects who scored zero to five, there was normal affect six to ten, mild symptoms eleven to fifteen, moderate. So the results of this study, then they looked at uh, after 12 weeks, the CRID score changed by minus 4.1 in the sertraline and minus 4.2 in the placebo group. So it was not statistically significant, so there was no difference between the sertraline group and the placebo group. One of the uh, hypotheses, one of the uh, reasons in the discussion when uh, authors looked at is they included a lot of subjects who had mild to moderate depression, and one of the thinking was that could be one of the reasons why they, uh, the intervention of the medication did, uh, certainly did not differ from placebo. Uh, this is a very common uh, uh, thing we see in uh, depression studies where uh, if we include patients with mild to moderate depression, uh, the uh, higher, higher placebo rate, response rate, it's harder to differentiate uh, from medication. So one of the uh, uh, points from the uh, authors was to maybe conduct a study with looking at more moderate to severe depression cases uh, and try to do a further trial in that group. Okay. Um, now looking at non-pharmacological interventions. Uh, one of the most common and most effective tools which has been studied is cognitive behavior therapy. Okay. So cognitive behavior therapy uh, is the, one of the most common psychotherapy which is used for patients who have depression or anxiety. Uh, the goal of cognitive behavior therapy is designed to treat dysfunctional cognition, negative emotions, and maladaptive behaviors or, or the patterns with patients develop gradually or uh, once they have the disease, and uh, so the CBT or the cognitive behavior therapy is targeted towards uh, uh, treating those uh, components. So uh, several studies have shown an improvement of depressive symptoms uh, with CBT, a significant improvement in depressive symptoms and quality of life with CBT. CBT has shown uh, not only improvement in depression symptoms, but Improved sleep quality, inflammation, and adherence to fluid restriction in patients with end-stage renal disease. So CBT has shown to be very effective uh, uh, in long term, especially in patients who have depression and uh, uh, end-stage renal disease. Okay. okay. So this is a study which was uh, conducted in patients with uh, chronic hemodialysis. Uh, patients who are undergoing chronic hemodialysis uh, and have been diagnosed with major depression. It was a randomized controlled trial which was conducted in Brazil. Uh, in the intervention group, there were 41 patients who received 12 weekly sessions of CBT uh, over three months by a trained psychologist. And in the control group, there were 44 patients who received treatment as usual. Uh, the mean participant, uh, participation rate in the CBT sessions was about 78.5%, so that's a pretty uh, significant number, about three-fourths of the patients that did participate in the sessions. So looking at the study, so they looked at uh, three months, and then they looked at outcomes at nine months. Okay? So compared to the control group, the treatment as usual, the PBD group had significant improvement in BDI, which measures uh, the, uh, depression severity, the mini scores, and even the quality of life dimensions. The important thing to notice here is at three months, which we expect, and even at nine months, so even when patients uh, stop uh, participating in the CBT session when the sessions are over, the effects were longer lasting without any side effects. Uh, okay. There's another study uh, looking at CBT for depression in patients with hemodialysis. This was a randomized crossover trial. Uh, we had about 65 participants who were enrolled from uh, two dialysis centers in New York. Uh, of those, 59 completed the study. So uh, they had a treatment first group where 33 patients uh, received the treatment and 26 percent in the wait list control group. So overall, all the patients received CBT, but in the first phase, one group, treatment first group, received CBT, and the second uh, 
the control group did not receive CBT. And then in the second phase, uh, the patient or the subjects in the control group received uh, the CBT uh, therapy, and the treatment first group were in the control phase. Okay. What they found in the study in the intervention phase, CBT was administered during dialysis treatment for three months, and participants were assessed three months and six months after randomization. So as compared to patients in the weightless group, treatment first group achieved significantly larger reduction in, in the BDI scores and Hamilton depression rating score uh, after intervention, which is kind of something we'll expect. Uh, now, 89% of patients in the treatment first group were not depressed at the end of treatment compared with 38% uh, in the weightless group. Okay? Mean scores for the treatment first group did not change significantly at three months follow-up. It suggests basically that patients who received uh, CBT for three months, they were able to sustain the effect even at three months post follow-up. Treatment first group experienced greater improvements in quality of life uh, and inter-dialytic uh, uh, weight gain uh, than the comparison group. Uh, now let's talk about exercise therapy. So there have been um, fewer uh, small studies where they looked at uh, using exercise therapy, and it has shown to be effective in improving depression symptoms. Uh, in, in one of the studies, uh, it's an aerobic exercise, which is one of the most common training uh, uh, measure in patients with uh, hemodialysis, intradialytic where they had an indoor stationary bicycle and interdialytic where between during a patient could go walk and do mild jogging to cycling uh, between the dialysis. So, um, in the study, they found 35% improvement in depression after six months of aerobic exercise on non-dialysis days, so regardless uh, uh, if they're doing the uh, regular aerobic exercise that showed improvement uh, about 35% improvement. Even home-based exercise training improved outcome. Okay. Uh, resistance exercise training. Um, here, patients use elastic band or wrist ankle weights for training during the hemodialysis therapy. So during the session, when they're uh, receiving hemodialysis, they were able to do these uh, resistance training. They had improved uh, health-related measures such as muscle and body comp uh, composition and quality of life. Uh, so there's limited evidence regarding uh, aspects related to mental health and depression in resistance exercise training. Uh, so there, there aren't many training, so, that's the, uh, so there are not many studies. That's kind of the major limitation here. Uh, there's one small study where eight patients who are undergoing hemodialysis, they showed improvement in the mental component of SF36 questionnaire. But again, it's, the sample size is too small. That's kind of the theme in most of the studies. Uh, uh, the, the, the we need larger sample size studies uh, to uh, have um, um, get better recommendations. Okay. So um, this was a review uh, uh, review where they um, uh, summarize um, data from exercise therapy. Um, so one of the recommendations was the minimum program length of six months with at least 35 minutes per exercise session to attain significant improvement in psychological-related par parameters. Okay. Uh, another recommendation of interruption for longer period of time will likely cause benefits to be lost. Intradialytic exercise is optimal and has lowered dropout rate. So those are the recommendations for exercise training uh, standpoint. Okay. Now, this is looking at um, uh, effects of yoga in patients with chronic kidney disease. Uh, this was a prospective study conducted in India. There were 54 patients admitted, who were admitted to the medicine floor. Um, uh, patients uh, who were in the intervention group, they, uh, they participated in yoga five days a week for about uh, 40 to 60 minutes every day. And in the treatment as usual group, they did the treatment as usual. Uh, for about six months. Yeah? Um, patients were advised strict yoga-based lifestyle modification. Patients were trained in yoga techniques and asana, their specific uh, 
postures like standing, sitting, and supine yoga, beautiful for kidneys, based on patient tolerability and how, how much they can handle. Patients were trained in breathing techniques and relaxation techniques, and they had um, um, you know, some of the uh, imagery and mindfulness, the stress reduction of, well, as part of uh, their relaxation technique. But they found that uh, as compared to the control group or treatment as usual, patients in the Euro group had significant reduction of blood pressure, uh, non-significant reduction in blood urea and serum creatinine, but significant improvement in phys physical and psychological domain of quality of life outcome in the yoga group. Uh, although patients in the yoga group, they require a uh, lesser number of dialysis, but it was not statistically significant. Uh, other component is meditation. So they have been studies looking at uh, meditation. So in meditation, the focus is uh, about on mind-body intervention, uh, where mind adapts to the body's physical symptoms through mechanism of parasympathetic nervous system and decrease in stress hormone levels. Uh, in a study uh, in the U.S., it was found that 42% of dialysis patients reported trying at least one mind-body therapy, whether it's meditation or, or some other form of medi uh, therapy, and 19% reported regular weekly use of meditation. Uh, again, the limitation studies that have been of varying quality, uh, most studies have reported positive effects on measures such as anxiety, stress, depression, sleep disorder, and quality of life uh, with meditation. Now, what are the barriers to treatment? Um, I think one of the major barriers is, you know, these patients are already, they have a high medication burden. They're already on so many medical medications for their, uh, for their medical conditions. Are they willing to take another antidepressant or a medication? Unwillingness to follow certain recommendations such as home exercise. So uh, if they're already feeling tired and fatigued, uh, and they have depression on top of that, so their uh, adherence to exercise, which helps not only the depression, but their physical symptoms as well. So that's another uh, barrier to treatment. Uh, the important thing, there was a survey conducted, and they found that nephrologists, you know, most of the patients who have end-stage neural disease, they follow the nephrologist. But the nephrologists often do not start therapy for depression and 82% believe that it's their primary care provider's responsibility to start uh, uh, antidepressants. So this was a, a shocking number, uh, but that's what the survey uh, results uh, showed. Non-availability of resources, uh, especially when we're looking at uh, combined behavior and medical interventions, um, which has shown to be uh, to better outcome even, um, in patients with depression, medication and psychotherapy, so there is non-availability of resources or limitation of resources. That's a major factor there. Okay. So what's the future? Um, I think the future is kind of looking at need for more cognitive behavior strategies, which are which can be easily integrated with the chronic kidney disease education. There have been some studies looking at uh, group therapy along with individual therapy or the group therapy uh, integrated with the chronic uh, kidney disease education. So that could be one way to approach this. Collaborative care model, uh, I think that has shown to be beneficial in uh, other chronic medical conditions such as patients who have diabetes or hypertension. Uh, collaborative care model has shown to be effective in uh, improving outcome in other chronic medical conditions. So I think that could be one way to uh, approach and do further studies and seeing the role of collaborative care model in, in, in this patient population. Uh, Patient-centered outcome in, chronic, uh, in clinical kidney research, sorry. Uh, so I think that that's an important uh, thing to look forward to in the future, kind of designing studies which looking at patient-centered outcome. Uh, and uh, randomized controlled trials studying various treatment modalities. Uh, I think that that's uh, an urgent need right now. There, I know there are some studies ongoing for medication, but at the same time, there are studies uh, looking at uh, uh, mindfulness-based therapy and other therapy uh, modality for this patient population. Okay. And these are the references, and I think with this, I'll end the talk, and I'm 
open for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Singh. Uh, Chris, could, could you uh, tell the participants how they may ask Dr. Singh a question if they wish? Yes, absolutely. At this time, ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to ask a question, just dial the 1 on your telephone keypad. Just dial 1 on your telephone keypad. Dr. Singh, while we wait for the questions, this is Mark again. I, I have a question for you. Are there any promising um, medications currently in the pipeline that you may be that you may be aware of that would work with patients with um, CKD and those in uh, ESRD. Um, anything that you know about coming down the pipeline that that have been approved or in clinical trials? Yeah, so I mean there are no new medication which uh, is uh, under trials. So most of the studies which are. Um, uh, ongoing right now are looking at the drugs which are already FDA approved. Again, SSRI, uh, bupropion. Uh, uh, so as one of the studies was looking at acetalopram. But I'm not aware of any new medication per se uh, 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 which is being studied in this population. Yeah. So we still start uh, with uh, with SSRI first because we don't need uh, dose adjustment in, uh, with uh, with the four SSRIs which have been studied uh, versus SNRI or atypical antidepressant, uh, we are a little bit more cautious and monitor for, uh, we need dose reduction monitor for their side effects. Thank you very much. And as of this time, we do not have any questions in queue. So just as a reminder, if you would like to ask a question, please dial the one on your telephone keypad. Okay, Dr. Singh, it, 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 if we don't have any additional questions from the participants, I'd like to give you a big thank you uh, for your thought-provoking and relevant presentation. Um, it was I, I learned a lot from this. Uh, I knew very little about um, the intersection of depression and chronic kidney disease, and um, I learned quite a bit. So thank you very, very much. I want to also say thank you to the Midwest Kidney Network for eliciting Dr. Singh's participation in this webinar and to all our participants today for spending a little time with us this afternoon. Also, thanks to Chris and Jennifer at WebEx for a typically smooth technical experience. Um, so for participants, remember your evaluation link and access to the CE certificate will come to your email in about five to seven days, likely before that. Um, complete the evaluation and you can create your CE certificate immediately. If you have any issues with this or you viewed this presentation this webinar as a part of a larger group, um, please contact me at m-l-o-u-s-h at mpro.org. That's m-p-r-o dot o-r-g. M-l-o-u-s-h at m-p-r-o dot o-r-g. I want to thank everyone for participating today. Again, thank you so much, Dr. Singh, for your time and uh, contributions to, uh, to, to our Learning in Action Network event. And thank you all for attending and have a great afternoon and evening.